welcome once again to EW10's Bookmark. I'm Doug Keck, air host. A special interview coming to us from Walsingham in England, our EW10 studios. Fiorella Nash is the author. The book, The Abolition of Woman, How Radical Feminism is Betraying Women, published by our friends at Ignatius Press, available through the EW10 Religious Catalog, EW10RC.com for all things Catholic. Welcome, Fiorella Nash, to EW10's Bookmark. Thanks for making the time. It's a great pleasure to be on the show. Thank you so much. Now, uh, this is, I think, your first nonfiction book. You're actually known more for writing fiction over the years, right? Uh, so what would be the kind of fiction yes. you've written, uh, and what are one of the characters you're known for? Well, um, probably the, the character most people associate with my writing is Father Gabriel. Um, some years ago, I started a mystery series. It's, it features an English Benedictine called Father Gabriel just after the war who's solving murder mysteries in a sleepy English village. So it's that sort of, that sort of idea. Think, of, think Agatha Christie, think Father Brown. Right. Yeah. How would you say, what's fun, the difference? Fun to write. Yeah, what would you think would be if somebody asked you that? What's the difference between Father Brown's approach and Father Gabriel's approach? Well, of course, they're set in slightly different times. So Father Gabriel, it's just after the war, so you've got a lot of buried secrets, a lot of people on the move trying to reinvent themselves. Mm -hmm. And because you're looking at a more broken world, I suppose, Father Gabriel has to be extremely sensitive. So there's a, a very strong pastoral side to the way Father Gabriel operates. You know, he will win the person over before he starts to question them. He's always aware that he's got very fragile souls in his care. So I think the period probably influences the way the, the detective has developed. Yeah, okay. so very, very much as of a pastoral priest. Now, in writing a book here, uh, The Abolition of Women, How Radical Feminism Betraying Women, there'd be probably a lot of mainstream people, let alone feminists, who would say, this is also a work of fiction, uh, when it's not in your mind, of course. <laughs> uh, what's the difference for you in how you approach writing fiction versus this book, nonfiction? Well, of course, both fiction and nonfiction require a lot of research. Um, I mostly write historical novels, and I usually spend a year doing my homework before I ever put pen to paper. So I think people are maybe surprised by how much research goes into fiction writing. But with nonfiction, it's a completely different form of writing. Mm -hmm. I wrote Abolition of Woman over a period of some years. It's really a culmination of many years of research into this field. I wrote numerous lectures and talks. I tried them out on audiences, particularly university audiences. So it was quite an interactive process, much more so than writing a novel. And of course, because I knew it was going to be very controversial, I had to be extremely careful mm -hmm. that I could back up everything I said, you know. Now, you write right in the beginning in the acknowledgments, I want to thank my husband, Edwin, for proving that there's no contradiction between chivalry and the support of a wife's career. Why did you want to make that point? Well, I think there's, there's such a sort of polarizing effect of, of mainstream feminism that assumes that chivalry is a terrible thing, that it's a form of soft sexism, soft patriarchy, that it has to go, and that no man who is supportive of his wife's career and her education is ever also going to be chivalrous. I think there's just an assumption that those things don't go together. And I wanted to make the point, a man can be a gentleman and also believe in women's equality. Right. Absolutely. You say, my own mother worked full-time alongside my father, however, coming from an immigrant family with a very different cultural perspective on womanhood is how you grew up. But you also say, my 1990s English convent School education introduced me to mm. feminism for the first time, but far from providing a young woman with the tools to develop intellectually, the feminism of the baby boomer generation came across as laughably antiquated, petty, and self-pitying. How so? Well, I think for a young woman growing up at the end of the 20th century, an awful lot of the arguments we heard just felt like yesterday's battles. There was a constant sense of victimhood from women who actually had been extremely successful. They had, that generation had all enjoyed 
a free university education on a par with men. They'd all advanced in their own careers. Um, I mean, the, the teachers who taught us, you know, they were very highly qualified. They were very much go-getters. They were, you know, high flyers. And the way they portrayed themselves and the way they seemed to be living were very, very different. Mm -hmm. And I suppose perhaps, you know, we we took for granted a lot of the rights we did have and we did enjoy the fact that we were getting a good education and it just seemed it just seemed really that it, it was it was like something out of the 1950s that that sort of self-pity that sense of being a that constant claim of being oppressed all the time just didn't square with the reality mm -hmm. are you still seeing that though today I think there is still a tendency to be very negative about what it means to be a woman. Um, I think part of the new feminism, which John Paul II spoke of um, in um, uh, The Gospel of Life, um, was that we should celebrate everything that is positive about being a woman. The fact is, I still believe that there are many struggles women face, and I talk about them at great length in the book, mm -hmm. the risks of trafficking, sex selective abortion, but also the sexualizing of women from a very, very young age. I have two daughters. It's something I have to think about a lot. But I'm also aware of the huge progress that women have made in the last 80 years. You know, I have opportunities my grandmother would not have had. Right. Um, and that's something that's happened in a relatively small space of time. So I think we should be celebrating a lot more the role that women are playing, the greater role that women are playing in society, rather than constantly falling back on this victim narrative that's frankly getting a bit tired. Right, you even said our senior boarding mistress who was Catholic and female but clearly resented being both uh, epitomized what I imagine to be the oh, worst <laughs> excesses of radical feminism. And you talk about at university, the whole women's rights vacillated between victimhood mm. and thuggery. And then you move on to the, the key point. Abortion, of yeah. course, was the untouchable jewel in the crown of women's liberation. Why do you think that is? Yeah. Well, I think it just, it became almost um, a doctrinal test of purity. I don't know at what point that actually happened. If you consider it was only in the 1960s that abortion became, uh, was taken on as a right or as a perceived right by feminist groups. But I certainly noticed it seemed to be like this sacred cow we all had to bow down and worship. And if you did approve of abortion and you did think it was a positive thing, then you were a feminist. If you even questioned it, then you were a heretic. You didn't really count as a feminist and you had no place at all within the feminist movement. And certainly that was really rammed home for me at university when the women's campaign, as it was called at the time, then the women's union, started a nationwide campaign to affiliate the whole university to a very radical abortion rights group. Right. And it just, it became the absolute focal point of feminist campaigning. Right, you say any woman who expressed the right to choose their own way was a self-hating anti-feminist deviant. And this is the point you really make that we see today, who needed bullying and shaming back yeah. into the fold or silencing altogether. It seems to be in some ways before yeah. we used to have the first part, it was there. But there's a new aspect to it which you get into, that shaming and bullying. You must be destroyed if you yeah. deviate. Yes. I mean, it almost feels a bit Soviet. You know, I'd go to women's meetings where any woman who expressed pro-life principles would immediately be jumped upon and vilified. And that's not what feminism was ever supposed to be about. You know, real equality should mean that a group of women with differing views, different perspectives, should be able to come together and have a civil conversation. But to say you're not really a feminist unless you uphold these principles. You're not really a woman. I mean, it goes even further than that sometimes, unless you support abortion, birth control, whatever. That sounds to me like the language of the so-called patriarchy. Mm -hmm. You know, telling women what they should and shouldn't be. If we really believe in giving women a voice, it means really giving women a voice, not saying you can have a voice, but you have to keep to this narrative. Right. You have, to, you have freedom of thought, but you must think these things, you know? Right. You quote, uh, it's either Gloria Steinem or uh, 
uh, was it Florence Kennedy, the famous line, if men could get pregnant, abortion would be a sacrament. Well, it, yeah. it seems like abortion actually is a sacrament, but not for men, but, but for the feminists. Well, this is what I found most disturbing about some aspects of contemporary feminism, is it feels like a pseudo-religion. I think an awful lot of ideological movements take on that kind of hue after a while. And it's almost like a, a, a kind of pseudo-religion which has its own doctrines, its own credo, and everyone has to conform to that. And, of course, as a result, it is alienating potentially millions of women who have a contribution to make to modern feminism, who have a contribution to make to women's groups, who want to see change, positive change, but who aren't prepared to subscribe to those ideas. But the whole mentality, yes, it feels like a sort of old-fashioned religion. You say here, my book is one of dissent. However, in exploring the inherently misogynistic mm -hmm. principles and practices underlying abortion to which contemporary feminism has become willfully blind, it is my hope that it will provide a positive way forward for women who may previously have seen the terms pro-life and feminist as diametrically opposed. Yes. Um, one thing I noticed when I was giving university talks, um, they would always be very well attended because anything with the words pro-life and feminism in the title, almost mm -hmm. by definition, to makes people curious mm -hmm. and I would have every single time you can probably imagine the type there'd be a small group of women would turn up with spiky hair and usually a few piercings and they'd all hold hands because obviously I'm so frightening that they all they all had to kind of bunch together to face me and they'd come with the idea of being very angry and so they would be duly angry but then during the Q&A we'd start to realize that actually we had some things in common and if, we, if I was lucky, one of them might actually say, do you know something, I thought I'd disagree with you about that, but actually there are some points of agreement. Right. And we'd realise there was, in fact, some common ground. And you know, that's what I would like to see. I would like to see more dialogue. I'm not out to get anybody. Mm -hmm. I want to see that conversation opening up you know, in, an, in an adult way, in a free way, um, and in a respectful way. Right. In the, in the section on the new patriarchy and its dissenters, and you alluded to patriarchy, you talk about a straw man argument against reductionism, which sees pregnancy in terms of two extremes, total focus on the rights of women or total focus on the rights of the baby. Yes. I mean, I quoted at length that passage from the Obsangaini News because I felt it really says everything you could possibly want to know about the very poor way in which the abortion debate is framed, certainly in the UK, and I, I imagine it's quite similar in the States. Mm -hmm. There's a tendency to behave as if a pro-life person has no interest at all in the woman. It's all about the baby, and it's as if the, you know, the baby's a free-floating fo entity and the woman isn't important. I have never met a pro-life activist of any political colour who was not at all interested in the mother. You know, if anything, I think we take a lot of concern for pregnant women. We have pregnancy crisis centres. You know, we have hotlines. Um, my own organisation, when I, I previously worked for a pro-life organisation, we weren't a welfare-based organisation. We were a political group. But if a woman came to us in need, we always had to stop what we were doing mm -hmm. and try to help her. So Absolutely. it's a completely unjust way of framing the debate, you know. And as you, as you will know in the States from the, the huge work that's being done over, the, over there. Absolutely. And, and elsewhere in this, you say the notion that the unborn child should be treated alternately as a baby or a mass of tissue dependent entirely upon whether or not the pregnancy is wanted may be attended as a way of supporting a woman's bodily autonomy. But this unscientific shifting of language unwittingly reinforces a misogynistic stereotype as women as shallow and childish. How so? Mm. Well, because it's, it's the misuse of language. And it's something that's impossible to avoid when it comes to looking at the debate. Um, I've got four children. And during every single one of my pregnancies, I never heard my baby described as anything other than a baby. And it wasn't a political statement. It was just a statement, a medical statement. My midwife, my nurse, my, uh, my obstetrician, whoever it was, would always refer to the baby in any discussion. The only time 
words like fetus and contents of the uterus and pregnancy tissue get used is in the context of the abortion debate. Mm -hmm. Now, either this is a mass of tissue or it's a baby. It can't suddenly become one thing or the other depending on how the woman's feeling. That's like the way you treat a little girl you know, or a little child. If you think that that's a unicorn, dear, it's a unicorn. You know, it's completely unscientific right. as, a way, as a way of approaching pregnancy. Well, you mentioned the thing, you can't turn your uh, cat into a canary, I think, right? Yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's that, you know, at the same time, you know, we're very keen on talking about right. informed consent and making sure we get the terminology right, but never in the case of abortion. You know, I compare right. it with, say, having your tooth out or another operation where the woman would be treated completely differently. If you make the point that we're kind of past this, you know, argument over life so much, really, yeah. for anybody who really is willing to own up to it. For me, the question is, when mm -hmm. does human life really begin to matter? And you say, from an entirely utilitarian perspective, does a child with profound learning disabilities really matter? Does an elderly person in the advanced stages of dementia matter, really matter? Does a newborn baby matter as much as a 50-year-old professor on the cusp of major scientific discovery. I mean, th these these lines probably could have come out out of some of the Nazis who talked about life not worthy of life. Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, obviously, I was, I don't believe, I believe that those weren't, as it were, questions that demanded an answer. I was making the point right. that the moment you start to talk in terms of when does life matter, you go down a very dark road. It's interesting you mentioned the Nazis because that's exactly what springs to mind. You know, as soon as you start to talk about human life in terms of how important they are to other people, to society, then you become a monster you know, because pretty much any human life could become superfluous. Well, you also quoted an Antonia Signor who put it this way, that nearly 200,000 mm -hmm. aborted babies in the UK each year are the lesser evil, no matter how you define life or death. For the matter, if you're willing to die for a cause, you must be prepared to kill for it, too. Yeah, and that's an extraordinary comment for a woman to make, a journalist to make in the 21st century. And I was trying to imagine if she'd said that in another context, whether people would have noticed that she was endorsing murder, basically, in the name of progressing an ideology. It seemed to me incredible that anybody would say that. Frankly, pro-life campaigners get in the way. I think I even say that in the book. Would you be prepared to kill a pro-life campaigner? Right. You know, for, because would that be the lesser evil? And again, it's like the, the, the Nazi utilitarian idea. Once you start talking about lesser evils, then you're going down a very dark road. Absolutely. You say here, in the black and white world of the abortion campaigner, since you brought them up, women fall into two distinct camps, the dispassionately rational and the blindly obedient. Define that. Hmm. Well, I was referring to an article that appeared in an Australian newspaper which was about a pro-life feminist organisation called w uh, Women's Forum Australia. And they deal with all sorts of issues, but also with abortion. And they were under attack because they were pro-life, basically. And the journalist stated that, made that distinction, you know, find out about the backgrounds of those directors and find out whether dispassionate feminist analysis or blind obedience to faith is the source of their views. And the implication was that if a woman supports abortion, it's dispassionate female analysis, dispassionate feminist analysis. If she disagrees, then it's blind obedience to faith. A woman can't possibly rationally come to the conclusion that abortion is wrong. Right. It's, it's an incredibly insidious argument. Um, and, and an absolutist argument in a time when we don't, we don't even right. accept a, a absolute truth in the, in the secular world. On page 45, you say, a common tactic to silence any discussion of abortion, even within the church circles, is the warning that it might upset, a, might upset women, especially women who've had abortions, although women are too delicate to cope with such a subject and need shielding from it, this ugly reality mm -hmm. by alpha males. What was your point you were trying to make there? Mm. Well, it was, it was two things, really. Um, the main point I wanted to make was that if abortion is to be treated as a choice, I'm, just, I'm saying that as an if within the secular society, then 
why should women not be expected to cope with the consequences of that? Women aren't children. A lot of the arguments that are being used at the moment, for example, when it comes to buffer zones outside facilities, I don't know if you've had a similar debate in the States about having safety bubbles around um, abortion facilities so people can't pray and can't have banners and whatever. The argument that keeps being trotted out is women need to be protected. Women are vulnerable. Hang on a second, we're not children. You know, you can't talk about choice and consent and then try and sort of hide, children, hide women away as if they're children who have to have their eyes covered. This is the reality. This is what abortion involves. And if you really want to be frank about it, you should be talking very, very clearly about what happens in an abortion you know, and not treating women as if they need protecting from that. I do, of course, understand that for women who've had abortions and there will be many within church communities, it is always going to be a very painful subject. I'm not saying that priests and pastors should not be very sensitive when they're talking about the subject, yeah. but don't avoid talking about it at all. Bear in mind, an awful lot of women who've had abortions end up working for the pro-life movement. Mm -hmm. you know, it can actually be, uh, it can be very important. It can be very important for women to be able to do that and to be invited to do so. You talk about shooting the messenger. In a Kafkaesque turn of events, the same court that acquitted Planned Parenthood for selling baby parts charged uh, Daleiden with attempting to buy them, a charge that surely only holds water if there's a seller involved. Isn't that the incredible disconnect we're living in? Yes. I mean, that was one of the most absurd examples I've ever seen of this Kafkaesque behavior and this, this shooting of the messenger. I compared his case, in fact, with cases certainly in the UK, and I'm sure there have been similar situations in the States, where undercover reporters have gone into care homes, for example, where there have been allegations of abuse and filmed members of staff abusing patients, or have gone into abattoirs and filmed animals being very cruelly treated. And in none of those cases have those people ended up being arrested. You know, what has happened is that there's been huge outcry and we've got to do something about these abuses. The person, the person who, you know, reported them those situations right. was generally regarded as very brave, you know. Right, absolutely. It, it's very, very different to what happened to Delayden. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Outsourcing re reproduction, in, in that chapter you say that fertility tourism is lauded within some areas of the Western media as a mutually beneficial system in which poor women can earn a significant sum of money and childless couples get their dream baby. However, fertility, fertility tourism is exploitive on a number of levels. What would they be? Well, it, it's difficult to know where to start. Um, with commercial surrogacy, it tends to involve a commissioning couple, usually from, from the States, from Britain, from Canada, buying or renting a womb, you know, paying for a surrogate to carry their baby for them. Now, in some of these countries, I refer a lot to India, though India, in fact, is tightening up very much its laws on this, in this area. But in these cases, quite often, the surrogate mother has no rights at all. She cannot be deemed to be the birth mother, as is the case in Britain and the States, for example, when, when there's a surrogacy arrangement. She may be forced to have an abortion if the couple change their mind, even if it goes against her principles. I even came across cases where women were given abortion pills without knowing it and were then told they'd had a miscarriage. Um, in extreme cases, you sometimes have situations where a baby will not be claimed. So both the woman is being exploited in that situation and also the baby who ends up parentless and stateless. So it's an incredibly exploitative system. It is rooted in the poverty trap, right. which leads women in developing countries to go this way. And there was one study I was reading where one of the surrogates said, who would do this to the, them, themselves? Who on earth would go through this unless they absolutely had to? And yet if you read reports about it in the Western press, it's always very positive. The dream baby who's going to be so loved and look at this lovely woman um, who's kindly carrying a baby for this couple is going to be paid lots of money and so everything's going to be fine. But the reality is very, very different. And we, we need to be a lot more aware of what is going on because it is fed by the whole consumer mentality in the West towards children. 
Right, and, and, and as you indicated, you kind of, the press moves on and the story ends and nobody knows about the, the rubble that's left behind. The other thing I was thought, I thought was interesting, you talked about mm -hmm. trafficking and the highly sexualization in the culture. Mm -hmm. It's interesting that with all this liberation and all this openness, it's incredibly how much more sexualized children are today than they even were in the past. Yes, it's extraordinary and it's becoming um, more and more of a problem in, in my opinion. It's not getting any better. If you look at the way very young girls are portrayed in an incredibly sexualized way, um, I quoted one uh, media charity's studies talking about the way even preteen girls are bombarded with these very, very sexual messages from very early. You know, we have to get to the root of the problem here. We can't worry about the hookup culture and all the other things that can happen that can go wrong with young women mm -hmm. if we're not protecting them when they're children right. you know it's it is absolutely feeding into this notion that girls are sex objects they're there to pleasure men it's all about their outward appearance and certainly i have two daughters and this is one of these conversations i have to have with them right. because and it can feel a bit like you're swimming against a tide Exactly. Uh, uh, I think that was a book or an article that you quoted also in the, in the, the book. But we're out of time for Ella Nash. The Abolition of oh. Woman, How Radical Feminism is Betraying Women by Ignatius Press. Available through the EWTN Religious Catalog. EWTNRC.com is a place you can find it. It's a very, very interesting book from a great writer, Fiorella Nash. Thank you so much for joining us on Bookmark. And thank you, all of our audience, for watching us. Look for the video coming soon, of course, on our YouTube channel and also on the network. And this has been an international bookmark brief. Thanks for joining us.